Uh, I want you to uh, join me, if you would, in the book of Acts chapter 8 tonight, Acts chapter 8. And um, I, I know I'm going to kind of just spend a few moments, if I may, just kind of introducing the text before we read it. All of us uh, tonight would certainly, if you, you're saved, you would agree with me that you, aren't you glad that God loves the world? <laughs> Uh, I am. I'm glad that God loves the world, the entire world. Speaks of his great love. The Bible does. And I, I don't understand. I've never been able to understand those who have said, you know, there's just this limited atonement that it's only for some and it's not for others. I've never been able to understand that because the Bible doesn't teach that. It's, it, you, you have to twist the scriptures to come to that particular conclusion. I mean, how do you take a verse like John 3:16? For God so loved the world. Is the world limited? No. God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The whosoever is anyone, right? It's people who make up the world. So God loves the world. 1 Timothy 2.4. God says, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. All men. Not some men, but all men to be saved. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. 2 Peter 3.9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is on long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So these verses speak, of course, of God's great desire for the world to be saved. And Jesus' last command, again, ought to be our first concern. So we've talked about this week, we've talked about the Great Commission, we talked about the fact that God has called us, God has called all of us to be involved in that, and it really should be uh, something that we understand is something that is not yet complete. Uh, it's not a good suggestion for the church to be involved in missions. It's a command for the church to be involved in missions. We are to be after the people of the world. Uh, so uh, God's desire is that all, all the world be saved and that every creature here is, has an opportunity to hear the gospel. The, the church, of course, then after they see people saved, baptize them and disciple them. And uh, that disciple, uh, discipling aspect, of course, is where people grow in their faith and become mature so that they can do the work of the ministry and go out and win others. And it's just like we saw in the church planning video. The church plants a church so that that church that's planted can plant other churches. That's really God's desire. This is just this, re this kind of reciprocal type of circular type of mentality. People are saved, they're baptized, they're trained so they can win people to Christ who get saved and get baptized uh, and trained and the cycle goes on and on. And so we, we understand that. That's been God's way for the last 2,000 years. So as I read the mandate, I don't see anywhere where some places in this world should be excluded. The Bible says that the gospel should preach, be preached in all the world. That means all the world. It means that the world needs the gospel. And our course of church exists for this purpose. Every church member is to be involved in helping get the gospel out to the world. Now, as was rightly stated in Ms. Primo's uh, video, not everyone's going to be called to be a church planning ministry. There will be some people probably said in this auditorium, you'll never leave the United States of America. Uh, you'll never go to a, a foreign field to be involved, perhaps even in, in, in even short-term missions. If you get the opportunity, I sure would encourage you to do that because it will impact your life greatly. But the truth of the matter is there may be some people who, are never, who will never do that. But you're just as involved in missions by your giving and by your praying and, and, and by being involved in the outreach here of our church as we have an opportunity to impact our community. So I want you to understand that. And so my thought is tonight, while God is concerned about the world, I think we'd all agree with that, wouldn't we? You'd have to argue with God if you'd say he's not concerned with the world. And so while God is concerned about the, the masses, the thing that I want to impress upon you tonight is that God is concerned about the one. It's not just masses of humanity, but God is concerned about individuals. And we need to see that tonight, and we're going to see that in our text here in the book of Acts, chapter 8. We'll begin reading together, please, in verse number 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south into the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and setting in his chariot, 
and read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I? How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired that Philip should come up and set with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep unto the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before the shearer, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, whom speakest the prophet this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when he was come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have once again, Lord, to gather and congregate at the end of this conference. Lord, just seems like a moment ago we began this conference on Wednesday night, and so much has happened over the last few days. And, Lord, it's all been a joy to my heart. I've been thrilled to be a part of it, thankful for the opportunity to preach to this church once again and, and, and to be able to just bear a little bit of our soul and a little bit of our heart and to share the Word of God and, Thank you for every missionary, Lord, that's been a part of this conference and how they've impacted the lives of this congregation, Lord, through their hearts and through their burdens and through their presentations and testimonies and opportunities to teach. And Lord, now tonight as we conclude this conference, and in just a few moments, Lord, we'll think about our part this year in giving. Lord, I pray that you'd help us in the next few moments just to give consideration to this text and Lord, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts and help us to see, Lord, your concern for the one. And Lord, I pray that you'd use it tonight to do a great work, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So again, we, in our text, we find this man, this evangelist, if you want to call him that, what, however you want to refer to him. I think he's referred to in the Bible as Philip the Evangelist. And uh, he's part of the first church in Jerusalem. He was no doubt reached through that ministry somehow, some way. But he was part of that first church in Jerusalem, and at, at a time the church had come under great persecution, as we read about that in Acts chapter 8, the first four verses, as uh, uh, that church had kind of just kind of clung to each other, and they really weren't fulfilling the Great Commission, and so the Bible says that God allows this persecution to come upon the church. And, and as it does, the Bible says that persecution scatters the church. And I love the fact that the Bible says that though they're persecuted, they don't quit preaching. The Bible says they went everywhere preaching the word. And God leads Philip down in the early verses here of chapter 8, down to a place called Samaria. And again, Samaria would not necessarily be the place that most of the Jewish converts would go because the Samaritans were looked upon as being uh, unworthy, so to speak, and they, there was a, a, almost this prejudice, but God led Philip down there, and God began to do this great work uh, among the Samaritans, and multitudes of them began, came to know Christ as their Savior. I, I don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us, but many, many came to tell us, come to tell, trust Christ as their Savior, and we see that God is moving among, think about this, the great crowds, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but uh, when I, I love to be a part of that. I still remember young days here in our church when I was just a boy, and Sunday morning, again, 20, 30 people sometimes would get saved here on a Sunday morning, and we rejoice over one, and we should. But boy, there were some days when we would see a host of people saved and families saved, and the next week they'd bring others, and they get saved, and you know, we'd see that over and over again. And, 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 you know, we've heard even about the Billy Graham Crusades, and all of us have heard about people that have been saved as the Billy Graham would preach to thousands and sometimes upwards of a million people, and, and hundreds and thousands get saved, and that's all well and good. Because Philip had that kind of ministry in Samaria. But at a point, God says to Philip, you're done here in Samaria. And he led him to a strange place. 
an out-of-the-way place, a place that no one would choose for themselves. But God led Philip to the desert, and there he would intersect with a man, a one, that God wanted to be saved. I want you to consider with me tonight, it's plain in our text that God is at work in unusual ways to reach this one man, this eunuch, with the gospel. I want to just give you a couple of thoughts tonight. We'll be finished in this service. But I want you to think about with me God's desire for the one. Would you notice that God, God's direction in Philip's life? We see that in verse number 26. The angel of the Lord spake to him. We see it again in verse number 29. That the Spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. Would you understand with me that when God obviously wants to use someone, that person must be directed by the Holy Spirit. They must, they must be directed by God. The Holy Spirit directs them. Philip didn't just go for a walk in the desert. Nobody would do that. I know there's some people that are, you know, into the, today that we're into all this extreme sports and some people, you know, do some extreme things. But Philip was a guy who God had called to ministry. And he wasn't just going to go for a walk in the desert. No, no, the Bible's very clear that the angel of the Lord spoke to him and, and told him to go leave Samaria, go down to the south of Jerusalem, into the desert. And the Bible explicitly says that he's to go in the way. Now, again, let me just explain for, for, for just the sake of explanation that when the Bible says the way, the way was a roadway, okay? So it wasn't, you know, we think of highways today. We think of, well, if you're going to go to Columbus, you know, you get on 71, you go south because they've prepared a roadway. Well, just in ancient days, there were no vehicles, but there were these pathways. There were these roadways that had been trodden down, and people would make their way from place to place. And God said, okay, Philip, you leave Samaria. You get into the way. You're going to go south from Jerusalem towards Gaza. Now, here's what you have to understand. Going from Jerusalem, you're going down. You're going from an elevated position down to a lower level. And as you're going towards the south of Jerusalem, what you're going to be going towards is the Dead Sea. When you get out of Jerusalem, you get onto that roadway. And even today, some of you will have the opportunity at some point, maybe, Lord willing, in the future, to go to the, to the lands of the Bible. And one of the highlights, of, get, uh, uh, of course, is going to Jerusalem and, and I've been there on a number of occasions, and I think to myself about this roadway that leads me south out of Jerusalem and takes me down into that desert way. And I'm telling you, it is desert. Today, you would find some perhaps nomadic people living there. There's still Bedouins. They pitch their tents there. They, they live in, in, in desert places. You'll, you'll see them leading their cattle from place to place. And so there's got to be some, I guess, some vegetation there. But there's parts of it that just absolutely barren. And that's the picture that we have here. He's in a desert. It's a barren place. There's not life there. There's not, there's not a congregation of people there. The Bible is clear. There's one man. He's led by the Spirit. The, the, it, we, if we reach the, uh, the one with the gospel, it, it'll take people who are filled and led by the Holy Spirit. Now, now look, I want to be clear that you don't have to wait to be led by the Spirit to witness to someone. We do have a command that we're to preach the gospel to every creature. But the truth of the matter is there are times when the Holy Spirit of God is leading us. And, and, and you know, if you pray in your life and say, God, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to be led by the Holy Spirit. I, want, I just want to be honest with you. God is able perhaps to change your direction someday. Did you know that? He may have you stop at a gas station you wouldn't necessarily stop at. He, he may have you buy something that you would not necessarily buy in, in that particular place. And it may just be the Holy Spirit of God is taking you there for the one. God took this man into the desert for the one. So no one will do what Philip will do in this text unless he's filled with and directed by the Holy Spirit. Again, who's going to leave a thriving place of ministry? Who's going to walk away from that and, and go do the kind of thing that Philip did unless God, the Holy Spirit, is leading him? One of the things we find out about Philip in Acts chapter 6 is that he was one of the first six that the Bible would term as deacons, at least that's the term that I give to them there in Acts chapter 6, is there's a little bit of a problem within the church and some fussing, and of course the Holy Spirit says, look, you got to deal with this, that's, that church needs to have a sense of unity. And by the way, churches need to be unified. Let's not allow little issues in our congregation to divide us. Let's be connected together. Let's be mature enough that when some little small thing happens, we're big enough Christians, we can brush that aside and say, you know what, that's not a big deal. I'm not going to let that offend me. Let's be unified. And so the Holy Spirit of God said, okay, you select six men, but the qualification of those six men was that they had to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know who was 
one of those people on that list? Philip. Philip was one of the first deacons here in Acts chapter 6. Did you know that you and I are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Amen. It's not some strange, weird issue, you know, to say, okay, I've got to go. And, you know, we, we see these people today, and I, I don't know why it is that it seems like trans and th this meditation thing is taking on steam. It's, I suppose it's just the spirit of the age. But you see these people, they're sitting around, and they, they got their legs folded, and they're holding their their hands just in a certain way, you know, and they're just kind of sitting there and they're, they're letting their whatever that's called zin or whatever, you know, uh, overwhelm them. And we almost have this idea that's what it, it takes for us to be filled with the Spirit. That's not what it takes for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. What it takes for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit is, first of all, to ask for it. Amen. The, the Bible says, be not drunk with wine, where it is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. So we have a command that it is God's command for you, for me, all of us, to be filled with the Spirit. It's not just for the preacher on Sunday morning. By the way, don't you want your pastor to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Amen. And you sure want people like Brother Jim, when they stand up to sing, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You, you want that to happen. I, boy, that choir special tonight was over the top. I love this one this morning with the, with the trio from the, from the cantata. That was awesome. I, I'm just saying, you want people who are singing to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And by the way, you Sunday school teachers, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit as well. you got those little children that are sitting there, and, and, and some of you that work in the bus ministry, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit so you can impact those children for the cause of Jesus Christ. So the Bible is very clear that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a command. We can pray. We can ask the Lord to fill us. And, and by the way, in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you need to ask the Lord to reveal to you if there are things in your life that are out of the way, things that ought not, that are there, that are not supposed to be there. Lord, show me the sin that may be hindering me from being filled with the Holy Spirit. But it's not some weird thing. Every person that's here tonight, the name's the name of Christ, can be and should be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Philip is led by the Spirit. I think one of the, the, the fact that we are lacking the filling of the Holy Spirit, so many of us today, is one of the reasons we are failing to reach this world with the gospel of Christ. If we're not filled, then we're not directed. If we're not filled and directed, we cannot be obedient to the Lord in the way that we should be. Philip was used by God to win this man to Christ because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 talks about the fact that the Holy Spirit of God gives us power. Be, but, ye are, ye sh but ye shall receive power, Jesus said to his disciples in Acts 1.8. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Would you notice not only does it involve being filled with the Holy Spirit, but it also involved Philip's obedience. Philip exemplifies what a spirit-filled Christian looks like and what he does. It's a person that is sensitive to responsive and obedient to God's direction. Think about the text. Here's Philip down here holding this big meeting. People are getting saved left and right. Uh, God's doing a great work and God says, okay, Philip, it's time to leave. You need to leave this place and you need to go to a unusual place. I've said this throughout this week. I, I, I believe I can fill, prove it biblically. I know I certainly can prove it Practically, but when God stirs in someone's heart to go do something, it's because God's already worked there. Okay, so you say, well, how do you know that? Well, I know that because in Acts chapter 9, when Saul gets saved, God says to Ananias, Ananias, there's a guy by the name of Saul who needs your help. And he says, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I know about that guy. He's not a good dude. <laughs> he persecutes the church. And the Lord says, no. Nope. You go help him because he just got saved. He needs some direction. God had already been working in Saul's life before he sent Ananias there. In Acts chapter 10, we find that God stirred in the life of Peter to go and, and to help a man by the name of Cornelius. And before he ever stirred in Peter's life, he was already working in Cornelius' heart to prepare uh, him so that Peter could come. I'm just simply saying that God often, when he leads us, when God stirs us, when God uh, calls us, when God uh, convicts us, when God says, here's what I want you to do, it's because he's working. You may say, well, you know, I feel con convicted. I should go find my relative this week or my neighbor or my coworker. I feel like I should be witnessing to them. It very well could be because God is working in their heart today that God leads you to go to, to witness to them this week. And so I just want to challenge you to understand that that's how God works in the life of the one. Would you notice God's work in the life of this eunuch? Well, very quickly, let me just touch on this and we'll be finished. Notice God's work in the life of the eunuch. First of all, I want you to see that it was an ongoing work. 
Philip and the eunuch connect, don't they? But before they ever connect, God has been at work in the life of this man, this eunuch, in a, in, according to verse number eight. He, he, he's, uh, God has been working in his life. The Bible says in verse 28, he was sitting in his chariot, but in verse number 27, it tells us that uh, bef- while he's sitting in his chariot, he has been to Jerusalem, and which you notice the phrase, he's gone there to worship. Now, I don't know exactly all that means other than what it means. <laughs> but, but here's the deal about the eunuch. It is possible, very well could be, that during the dispersion of the Jews, that this eunuch is Jewish. You know what happens in the life of a Jew who's really Jewish? They worship their God. That there's a command in the Torah that there are three times a year to prepare to, to go and celebrate the festivals. Not all of them could do that because of distance, but it was the desire of most Jews, at least once in their life, to get to Jerusalem to celebrate either the Passover or, or the Feast of Tabernacles or one of those great feasts, Pentecost. And the Bible's clear here. This man has been to Jerusalem for to worship. Now, if he's not a Jew, it is possible that uh, the, the work of, that had happened in Acts chapter 2, that when uh, all these Jews from under heaven have been there on the day of Pentecost and the disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit and they begin to preach and, 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 and they begin to witness and we hear that 3,000 are saved and 3,000 are baptized and 3,000 are added to the church. It is very possible that some of those people were, again, just visiting in Jerusalem and are going to go back home and maybe as they go back home, they begin to witness and they are witnessing. I don't know exactly, exactly the whole circumstance here, the Bible doesn't say, but he does come to worship. And I want you to understand that as he's in Jerusalem, the indication is whether he purchases it or someone gives it to him, he probably had to buy it because he is a, seemingly a man of means, but he purchases the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he just happens to be reading of all the chapters in I, the book of Isaiah, there's 66, as you may know, there's 66. He just happens to be dealing with chapter 53 that deals with the sacrifice of the Messiah that speaks of what he does for us. Isn't it amazing how God leads people? So his, life, his work was ongoing. This sovereign, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent God was at work. And not only is he working in his life, but he's working in other people's lives as well. Would you notice not only is his was this ongoing, but would you notice his work in the life of this eunuch was without prejudice. We're not told much about this man from Ethiopia. Clearly, he's a man of prominent position, isn't he? He's the treasurer of the queen, which means he has a cabinet position. He's got high authority. He's probably educated. But would you notice, please, the Bible is very clear uh, whether... Uh, you know, whether, whatever the case may be, this man has an issue. He's called a eunuch. And according to the law, eunuchs are not welcomed into the temple. Whether he's a Jew or not, he wouldn't be welcome to go into the temple because of his body being mutilated. And it is very possible that his skin color was black, being from Africa, that in and of itself sometimes can cause people's prejudice. But I'm glad to tell you there's a God in heaven who's not prejudiced. It doesn't matter what your situation may be. It may not matter what your skin color is. It may not matter what your ethnicity is. It, may not, it doesn't matter to God what your background is or how much education you have or whether you are mutilated or not. God in heaven loves us and he's without prejudice. I think we are aware of that as a church. I'm grateful that Cleveland Baptist Church is an ethnically diverse, racially diverse congregation. Heaven's going to be like that. Did you know that? And we need to welcome one another. It's important to know that God is not a respecter of persons in this New Testament age called the church. Would you notice that God's work involved the truth of Scripture? God uses the Word of God in the life of this man, He's reading the Bible. We shared with you this morning of the 7,117 languages that are spoken in this world, only 698 have an entire Bible. Another 1,500 or so have, some, have a New Testament, and another 1,700 have a portion. But there are over 3,700 languages that have no Bible whatsoever. 
And I'm here to tell you that part of what we need to be concerned about is that, hey, if we're going to reach people, you can go tell people about Christ, but how are you going to grow them unless they have the Bible in their language? This man was able, obviously, to read Hebrew. So he's reading the prophet Isaiah, and God is using this particular scripture. Perhaps the eunuch is curious about the story of Jesus. Clearly he is as he's reading. And how does this all play out about this man that I've heard by the name of Jesus who died in Jerusalem not long ago and rose again? And, and, and so as believers, we've got to understand that God's word is powerful. Then I want you to see, finally, it involved a man to explain to him, to help him to understand God's desire for him to have a relationship with him. Notice in verse number 31, the eunuch is smart enough to say, and he said, Philip says, do you, do you, you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I, except some man should guide me? You know, there's something about being a teacher. I'm, I've had the opportunity to teach in the Bible Institute. I'm not, obviously, um, one that has a calling to teach in a classroom on a regular basis. But teachers love to teach because they love it when the light goes on. Somebody that is struggling to get it, a concept, a principle, a truth. And God enables them to have that ability to explain it. And that light goes on. Do you know there's a lot of blind people in this world tonight? They're not physically blind. They're spiritually blind. And God is looking for some people to be teachers. Somebody who can take this book and walk somebody down what we call the Romans Road of Salvation. To share with them that there's a God in heaven who loves them, who died on the cross for them. As God was concerned about this eunuch, it wasn't because he was prominent though he was. It wasn't the fact that he had this position with Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, though he did. God was concerned about this man because God had been working in the life of this man. I'm glad that God is concerned about somebody who lives in perhaps the poorest section of our, our city. Just as if he's concerned about the person that lives in the richest section of the city. And do you know, as I think about this missions conference, really as we think about it tonight and what's happening here in this text, you know, we could certainly say this, this applies to missions because somebody is being reached and that person's going to leave and go influence others. There's some folks in this church, and you live in the, an area that are, perhaps are pockets in which we're seeing migration from different countries and people are gathering around us. You know, God sometimes brings the mission field to us. Did you know that? If we're not careful, we can just kind of overlook that and say, well, you know, that's, you know we're going to send a missionary, we're going to miss, send missionaries to Korea, but we maybe have Koreans living around us and we just ignore them. Or perhaps, you know, maybe there are some other refugees from other parts. Uh, we've had some families from the Congo who have become political refugees here in the United States, and we've had some of them come uh, here to our church, and I'm, I'm just simply saying we should be concerned about people like that. But the point is, is that God is concerned about people tonight. Not just the multitudes, he's concerned about the one. And I want to ask you tonight as we're concluding this service, I want to ask you this question, who is the one that you're concerned about tonight? Who's the person that God is stirring in your heart as I'm talking tonight about someone who God has put you in their life. It could be a neighbor. It could be a child that's an adult child, or it could be a father or mother. And I'm just saying that many of you have no doubt have witnessed to people, and you know, you feel like, well, you know, I'm not making any progress, but I'm here to tell you, you don't know what God is doing. And that one that you're thinking about tonight, there's a reason that God has put them on your heart. And so as we think about the masses of humanity, whether it's the five billion that live in the 1040 window or if it's a place like South Africa where little children need a, some folks to help them because they're orphans. 
or it's Russia or the Roma people, whether they're here in the United States or across the face of the globe. It's the one. It's the one. God is concerned about the one. Aren't you glad that God was concerned about you? And so we should be concerned about other people. God is on the move in this world, and until he comes, we are to be involved. And missions is more than just filling out this little piece of paper tonight and dropping it in the collection box in the back. However, the pastor is going to give direction on how that's going to be done tonight. It's more than coming by and just picking up a prayer card like this one from the Womack family. It's up here on the platform or one of the other tables. It's more than those things tonight, just picking up these cards and being excited about missions this, these few days. It's about, again, as we talked about this morning, praying for God to send laborers into the harvest field. It is about the giving. But can I also say it's about reaching our Jerusalem here as well. The people that God puts into our lives. God moved this man by the name of Philip to a desert place for a man that God had worked in his heart. I don't know who God's going to put in your path this week. But we should be prepared, shouldn't we? We should be prepared to share our faith, and we should be prepared to try to win them to Jesus Christ. I truly believe that if, our, if we just get a heart for people, you know, so often we just get so caught up, and I say we because I'm like this as well. I have to work on my, my disposition. Did you know that? I have to work on putting a smile on my face sometimes because I can get a little bit twisted from time to time. You'd never know that, of course. But the truth is, is that, you know, being a grumpy old person is not going to win anybody to Christ. But people that have the joy of the Lord and the Holy Spirit leading them, that's attractive. There's something about that that draws other people. You wonder, don't you? Don't you wonder? I do. Why this eunuch would look at Philip and say, you want to come up here and sit with me for a while? There had to be something about him as he approached this eunuch that God says to the heart of that eunuch, here's a guy who can help you. I don't know about you, but I want to be that kind of guy that God can use to reach other people. Would you bow your heads together with me in prayer tonight? Thank you so much for being here. And it's been a joy this week to be a part of this missions conference. But God is concerned about the one. Not only the masses of humanity, but he's concerned about the one. And so let's be concerned about the one as well. If we're desirous tonight to see the world saved, then it begins by reaching those that are around us. May God help us tonight as a church to respond as the Holy Spirit of God. Maybe there's people that you're burdened for tonight, someone that... You think about, as we've spoken about, the one. You certainly, right now, could be praying for that person. You don't necessarily need to come to the altar, but maybe you should come to the altar and pray. But I, I, whatever God, the Holy Spirit, leads you to do. I want to encourage you tonight to allow the Spirit of the living God to guide and direct you. Let's ask him for his filling and for his power. Perhaps some of us, it's been a while since we've led someone to Jesus Christ. Maybe it's time that we get serious about this and say, Lord, would you help me this week to find the one that I may be able to win them to Christ?